Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I am Charlie Sykes. It is Wednesday. Tomorrow, of course, will be the big primetime hearing of the January 6th committee, and uh, there is evidence that it's having a cumulative effect. We will uh, talk about that also. In case you were looking for more data points about the uh, level of insanity in the Republican Party, uh, we are getting fascinating stories. <laughs> Out of, out of Arizona, Wisconsin, and Maryland. So let's start there with our guest, my colleague, Bill Crystal, who joins us again. Thank you so much, Bill, for coming on the podcast. Happy as always to be with you, Charlie. Okay, I, I, let's talk about Maryland. I have here the Vice News story. A man who organized buses to Washington on January 6th tweeted during the Capitol riot that Vice President Mike Pence was a traitor tried to impeach Maryland Republican Governor Larry Hogan over his actions to stem COVID and spoke at a QAnon conference this spring, just won the Republican nomination for Maryland governor. Now, you think I'm going to stop there, right? But they go on. And he's not even the most extreme candidate Maryland Republicans nominated for statewide office on Tuesday. His coattails helped his friend and ally, Michael, was it Perutka? a Christian nationalist and former board member of the neo-Confederate Secessionist League of the South, whose extreme views are almost too numerous to enumerate, win the GOP's nomination for attorney general. Um, And in something of an understatement, uh, they write, their wins show how radicalized and conspiracy theory minded a significant segment of the Republican base has grown in response to COVID and Trump's lies about the 2020 election even in a Democratic-leaning state like Maryland. So, Bill Crystal, what happened in Maryland last night? You know, it's, sometimes it's especially in the Democratic <laughs> states that the Republican base gets more radical. It's smaller, right? So in mm-hmm. a certain way, it's, and it's less concerned with winning. So sometimes that's a bit of a check, though it hasn't been in states like Pennsylvania. It doesn't look like it's going to be in Wisconsin. But but, mm-hmm. but in some places, it, it checks the craziness, whereas here they can indulge in it because they probably don't win anyway. But it, just to make to dot the I and cross the T on that, because it's even what could make the point even more strongly. Why did Cox win? He was endorsed by Trump. Uh, the, the person who lost was a cabinet member of in Gov- Governor Hogan's administration, a two-term Republican administration that was pretty was immensely successful popular. and popular in Maryland. Yeah. Governor Hogan supported her, campaigned for her, and couldn't, and she's a very, you know, respectable candidate. I would say there were no obvious, you know, red flags or anything, and she couldn't win. So it shows how much, how, you know, how radicalized the base is, and look how powerful Trump remains with the base. I, no way Cox wins without Trump's endorsement. And in Wisconsin, I mentioned this earlier, my home state of Wisconsin, uh, we, we learned yesterday, I think, that Donald Trump actually called up Republican Speaker of the State Assembly, Robin Voss, to pressure him to decertify the 2020 election. There was a Supreme Court ruling here that said that they imp- improperly used drop boxes. Uh, yeah, this is, you know, after the fact. And so, and, and Trump actually wants the Republicans to decertify the electoral votes from Wisconsin from the 2020 election. Robin Voss, who has done everything he can really to kiss up to, to Trump, is obviously not going to do that because it's unconstitutional. But today... Trump is doubling down on this, putting out a statement on what is a tr- truth social or whatever. So what's Speaker Robin Voss doing on the great uh, Wisconsin Supreme Court ruling declaring hundreds of thousands of Dropbox votes to be illegal? This is not a time for him to hide, but a time to act. I don't know his opponent in the upcoming primary, but feel certain he will do well if Speaker Voss doesn't move with gusto. Robin, don't let the voters of Wisconsin down. So... Here you have the former president of the United States taking, I think, literally the most insane position you could take, uh, asking Wisconsin Republicans to take back votes from an election that took place nearly two years ago. I mean, it's one thing to say that that, that Trump is engaging in a big lie. I just kind of want to underline the fact that if you make a continuum of just the nuttiest possible positions on the election— Trump is always the captain and the quarterback of Team Crazy. Yeah, and I mean, which uh, one hopes, one expects at some point that we pay some price for that. Just on that Wisconsin Supreme Court opinion, as I understand, it was 4-3, it was controversial, yeah. whether it was right or not, that they shouldn't have gone ahead with the drop boxes as a way of handling the pandemic emergency and the need to let people vote right. remotely, so to speak, or, or uh, early and also, you know, safely. 
But no one has questioned the actual, they were real people who cast real votes. Real. If the drop boxes hadn't been there, they would have gone to the polling place and cast the votes or Correct. to the you know, community center and not done it through a drop box. That was a convenience. Maybe the they should, the court shouldn't have allowed it or the administration in Wisconsin, the executive branch shouldn't have allowed it without legislation enabling it. That's, I guess, what the court decided. And therefore, going forward, as at least based on current law, there won't be those kinds of remote, those kinds of drop boxes. But there's no charge of actual no. fraud or impropriety. There's just a, a kind of complicated an issue of how much executive discretion, in a sense, they had in administering the elections under the uh, cloud of the pandemic. So Trump is, of course, lying about what the court said. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, and then asking for the impossible, I guess. The, 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 but it, again, will any? I don't know. Will you? You're there. I mean, do any of the no. three Republican gubernatorial candidates are they are they denouncing Trump's intervention here? Are they no. defending the Speaker of the House? No. My guess is that uh, they're all going to be in the tall grass about all of that. I mean, it's sort of like different. Uh, as uh, my my fellow cheesehead Bill Leader writes in the Bulwark, it's kind of an embarrassment of riches. Just you know, which flavor of of delusional denialism do you want? Uh, radicalism do you do you want here you, you know it is interesting the way that uh, trump has uh, zeroed in on on speaker robin voss this i think goes back to the sort of the reptilian instinct that uh, trump has that he senses weakness and he looks at robin voss and he says this is somebody who is weak that i can bully because he's sucked up to me in the past you know he he ran down to was it alabama to attend a game with him he, you know you know, just to kiss uh, Trump's ring. Voss is one of those establishment Republicans that thinks you can, you know, toss a little bit of red meat to the baby alligator and it not grow up and eat you. So he's bankrolled this completely bogus investigation that's turned into a complete joke with a former Supreme Court justice who has repeatedly be clowned himself. And he's done this because he thought this would appease the, the Trumpist radicalized base. And all it's done is energize them and basically put a big target on his back that he's a wimp and Trump sees him as a wimp and therefore is going to continue to beat up on him. I mean, this is the instinct of the bully. And so I think it's going to go on. Will it have any effect? No. But just to underline your point, there's no evidence whatsoever that any of those drop boxes contained invalid or fraudulent votes in any way. That's number one. Number two, the Supreme Court ruling there's a lot of language that's quite deplorable in it, but basically what it said was that in order to make this change, you couldn't just do it through the you know non-elected Wisconsin Election Commission, that the legislature needed to make take action. So that's sort of a separation of powers issue. It does not invalidate the election in any way whatsoever in Wisconsin. But also speaking of Republican speakers of the House, uh, a few hundred miles from you in Arizona, Rusty Bowers. Get who, to that. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, good. And that's I mean, it's, it's striking, right? I mean, he testified under oath before the January 6th committee quite memorably. Said afterwards and said that he might still vote for Trump again. You and I criticized him for that, I believe, and he sort of backed off a little from that. But anyway, testified under oath as to factual things that had happened between November 3rd and January 6th. No one has challenged a single to my knowledge, fact that he cited, conversation that he testified about. He, it wasn't an opinionated testimony. It was a very restrained one, actually, quite fact-based. And so he testified under oath. And for that, he's been censured by the Arizona Republican Party. I mean, and he's the Speaker of the House in Arizona. And he's a respected figure and a quite conservative figure, incidentally, who went along with a lot of stuff that you and I wouldn't have, I think, over the last few years, sure. but whatever. I mean, that just, again, shows the degree the depth of radicalization uh, in these parties now in Maryland and Wisconsin and Arizona. Yeah, it's not getting better, I'm afraid. Yeah, I mean, you you talk about, uh, you know, that and what happened in Maryland, Wisconsin, Arizona. You, you have Herschel Walker down in Georgia. You have Eric Greitens in Missouri. You have Blake Masters, in, 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 again, and also in Arizona. It just keeps going on and on and on. But this story out of, I mean, the Rusty Bauer story, I mean, as you point out, the, the Arizona GOP Executive Committee formally censured him saying that he is, quote, no longer a Republican in good standing. In case there was any doubt about what happens when you tell the truth, what happens when you stand on principle, you are excommunicated. So, you know, th this wasn't an expulsion. It, you know, it doesn't obviously do anything. But, um, and, and again, so Kelly Ward is the chairman down in uh, the Republican Party in Arizona, who is a complete nut job. And uh, the... The reasons for the censure included Bauer's support of a bill giving taxpayer-funded in-state tuition to migrants, his support for billion-dollar education spending bill, his, okay, none of which has 
anything to do with why they actually censured him. They censured him right. because he he testified. Which brings us to the January 6th committee. Big hearing tomorrow night, prime time, uh, connecting the dots, filling in the blanks about what happened on January 6th, uh, making the case that the president of the United States who takes an oath to see that the laws are faithfully executed, in fact, uh, was guilty of a dereliction of duty. So, Bill, there's a very interesting analysis in uh, Politico suggesting that, you know, the conventional wisdom about the committee was that, you know, no, you know, no single revelation was going to change Republican minds about Donald Trump. But what happened instead, David Siders writes, is a slow drip of negative coverage. And that may be just as damaging to the former president. Six weeks into the committee's public hearing schedule, an emerging consensus is forming in Republican Party circles, including in Trump's orbit, that a significant portion of the rank and file may be tiring of the nonstop series of revelations about Trump. The fatigue is evident in public polling and in focus groups. And then he cites our colleague uh, Sarah Longwell's focus groups, where she finds uh, a group of uh, Trump voters uh, unanimous and saying, yeah, we'd like to move on. So give me your sense of the impact so far of the January 6th hearings, whether or not this is wish casting to say that it's uh, that it's causing Trump fatigue. I think it's causing uh, some Trump fatigue and uh, some people who, I mean, God knows they should have known all this already, uh, but the details <laughs> stick in a way perhaps that the more general judgment doesn't. And when it's Bill Barr saying that the guy was delusional and not you or me or even mm-hmm. Liz Cheney in a speech, or, or certainly not Democrats, that that helps. It seems to have, I think, hurt him some with Republican donors and elites. I think uh, the polling suggests that uh, it's sort of among college, college educated Republicans. Having said all that, it's knocked him down from what, 60% to 50%, basically, in the polls as the first choice for 2024. It's knocked his favorable down from you know 80% to 70%, or probably even higher, 85 to 75, something like that, which is not nothing and, and matters if you're Ron DeSantis plotting your, your challenge to Trump. But I mean, in a way, it's unbelievable that he's still as high as he is. But I do think the committee's been important. A, it's just important to get the truth out, obviously, about what happened. And B, it has shown that you know, it's been an example of actually a competent execution of, of responsibility of Congress, which is kind of good for the country to see that. It, it, Congress has failed so often, and all the parts of government fail so often, Secret Service, places one might have had somewhat high opinion of, turn out to be not great. Uh, to see something working well and people behaving honorably and intelligently in carrying out their duties is a good thing. And I say that with particular reference to Liz Cheney, obviously, I guess, but I also, you and I discussed this a bit before, Speaker Pelosi putting Liz Cheney in such a prominent role. That's not an obvious thing to do. She took grief from her members for doing it. I was on a call with someone, some staff people from the 1-6 committee, and they won't talk about this kind of thing at all, but I was joking about, hey, getting, did you have any problems with any of the Democrats saying, hey, how come she's the star of this? You know, <laughs> She's kind of late to the party here, and, uh, you know, and some of these Democrats were pretty impressive in the impeachments and so forth, and are intelligent people. People. And, you know, the discipline there has been impressive. So for all the partisanship, there's a little bit of a, there is some willingness here to say, no, what's best for the country, what's best for the bringing out the truth. And I think the witnesses also, but including Rusty Bowers from Arizona and others who, you know, of course, Cassidy Hutchinson will see uh, Matt Pottinger tomorrow night and Sarah Matthews. So I, I think it's the one six committee hearing has been good for the country beyond the sort of eroding Trump's uh, support a bit in the Republican Party. Well, I, I agree with all of that. So you dropped something that I will come back to the, the committee in just a moment, but I, I didn't want to gloss over, you know, the emerging story about the Secret Service text messages, which I find to be gobsmacking on so many levels that this, the Secret Service now is acknowledging that it uh, deleted all of these uh, text messages after they were requested. Look, I... Taking a deep breath here, I'm, I'm trying to think of an innocent explanation for this. And I have to tell you, Bill, I'm coming up short. No, I, I this, totally this just seems like a disgraceful episode uh, in, in, the, in Secret Service history. Disgraceful. And, and I think one can judge it based on what we now know, purposeful, at least at some level among some people. The way in which they ask people to deal with it, well, we're turning over, our, changing our phones, whatever. So all you agents, these are you know people who work hard and are very busy and have a zillion of these text messages. You can imagine what it's like to be a Secret Service agent. I mean, leaving aside Trump, just in life in general, right? It's that we're, we're five minutes early. I mean, there must be you know 
tens of thousands of them if they're communicating by text a fair amount of the time. You know, take a look, you know, make sure we may go visit this ice cream place. So, you know, we need security there. I was in the White House. I know what that's like. And it used to, a lot of it's done, obviously, mm -hmm. by people speaking into those earpieces that we're so familiar with seeing, this, seeing Secret Service agents wear. But a lot of it these days, I, I imagine, is done by text. So, so there are a zillion of these things, and they seem to have, if I'm not mistaken, on January 25th told the agents, you guys have responsibility to go through and save the ones that are relevant and upload them by January 27th. I think that's right, which is nuts. Obviously, who has time to do that? If you if you ask people right. to do that, they're just going to assume it's not serious. I mean, you and I have been in corporate settings where things had to be preserved or were asked to be preserved or unfortunately been in one or two even legal situations where that was the case. And if you know what, you know how you do that if you're this U.S. Secret Service? You tell the agents, you bring your phone here. We will have experts who will go over the phone with you or even you just leave it there and transfer your text messages to a safe, you know, uh, server somewhere. And then you can have your phone back, you know, two days later or, or two hours later, I, you know, however it works. But the idea that they just ask the agents, hey, you know, you're busy. You're on an eight-hour shift to Robert Chang. Would you please up, go over these messages and upload them to some server? They don't even, people don't know how to, I wouldn't know how to do that, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But instructions are available if you waste, you know, have another two hours to waste going online. It's ludicrous. And they didn't intend to save them, in my opinion. And it's really, a, I agree, it's it's really shocking. Our colleague Amanda Carpenter sent me a note for uh, my Morning Shots newsletter. We now know that the migration didn't start until January 27th, which is after multiple congressional committees made explicit requests to preserve such records. Absurdly, the Secret Service still insists it properly reviewed and turned over all relevant documents, including the ones the agency disappeared. And she says that sounds unbelievable in the truest sense of the word. I completely agree with her there. As I guess you probably figured out by now, losing weight is impossible when you can't control those cravings throughout the day. Salty snacks or sweet treats are always within reach. And what about the temptation of all those summer barbecues? Well, the new weight control formula from New Sioux Labs uses biohacking technology to curb your appetite and control those unwanted cravings. Formulated with natural ingredients and antioxidants, this new weight control formula helps you maximize a healthy metabolism and keeps you away from all of those empty calories safely, naturally, and without the harmful side effects of restrictive diets and supplements. And this one-of-a-kind formula has the mood-enhancing ingredient in dark chocolate to keep you from getting hangry. New Sue guarantees you will lose up to three pounds in the first week guaranteed or your money back. And right now, get a free bottle with your order. That's New Sue Labs dot com slash bulwark new sue labs dot com slash bulwark join new sue's world-class concierge program for an extra 10 percent off at checkout free month supply free priority shipping that's new sue n-u-s-u labs dot com slash bulwark new sue labs dot com slash bulwark these statements and products have not been evaluated by the food and drug administration these products are not intended to diagnose treat cure or prevent any disease or condition these statements and information are not a substitute or an alternative for seeking care from your health care providers okay so back to the one six committee I think one of the things that they have done, and again, it's maybe people take some of this for granted. I agree with you about, you know, Nancy Pelosi's decision to uh, give such a leading role to Liz Cheney and to Adam Kinzinger, who's going to be, you know, having his star turn uh, tomorrow night. But also the fact that it feels like all of the witnesses, with the exception of some of the law enforcement officers and one filmmaker, they're all Republicans, either elected Republicans, appointed Republicans, many of them within Trump world. Tomorrow night, we're going to hear from uh, Matt Pottinger, who was national security aide uh, for all four years of the Trump administration, right up till January 6th, uh, Sarah Matthews, who is, you know, a flack, you know, in the White House. Uh, so these are Trump's people. And I think that that has been one of the most powerful things that the, the call is coming from inside the House. These were all of the folks from the Department of Justice who testified were, tr you know, Trump era appointees, Bill Barr, the ultimate Trump loyalist. I do think that that's uh, that's been powerful. The other thing that people like us need to remember is that we pay lots of attention to this stuff. But when you have something on primetime television, Things that you and I may have been talking about for a year and a half will be new to millions of Americans. And that's not nothing. That is that is significant. So I do think this the cumulative weight comes up. But on on the question of whether or not the Trump fatigue has been setting in, and you cited some of the poll numbers, we have the poll out of Florida 
which shows uh, DeSantis uh, handily beating Trump in his home state. It is his home state, but there's another poll out of Michigan showing uh, DeSantis within within the the margin of error. We're now getting, you know, reports that Glenn Youngkin, who has been the governor of Virginia for about five minutes, is making moves. So, I mean, clearly there's there's something going on there. So I guess the question comes down to, you know, Trump may be weak, but somebody's got to take him on and it's got to be a one on one because if it's a, if it's a crowded field, it's going to be 2016 all over again. So what do you think? Who takes him on? Does DeSantis blink or does he pull the trigger to use two cliches in a row? I think people will take him out. I, I thought that even months ago was I just think it's, if you, you know, if you're an ambitious politician and you're, you, you don't pass up a moment and you don't know where Trump will be a year from now, even if leaving aside the 1-6 committee, right, if, if you're making a decision at the end of 2022. So I, I think DeSantis goes. I wouldn't be surprised if Youngkin runs. He thinks there's a lane of being a little less harsh than DeSantis. And also, we just have so much experience. You're in Wisconsin, Scott Walker in 2015, people who are very well-regarded governors yeah. and you know, genuinely have a lot of support and raised $30 million or something. And then they just kind of blow up they, you know, on the they launch don't go pad anywhere, right? to use another uh, whatever. President John metaphor. Conley. You know. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's it, it would be prudent. And Youngkin's one term limited in, in Virginia. So I don't think it's foolish for these people from their point of view to run. They'll, oh, you'll antagonize the Trump people forever. I'm not so sure about that. They run and they, they're polite to Trump. They just sort of say it's time for a change. I think I can win a little more easily. Uh, some of them will be less polite if they're on the Liz Cheney uh, sort of side of the spectrum. But uh, Christie will run as the slightly less more willing to challenge Trump than, than Youngkin, who will be slightly more willing to to be different from Trump than DeSantis and Tom Cotton or someone who actually voted to uphold January 6th. I think it'll be a multi-candidate race. The question of whether, as you say, they then narrow the field in 2023 so that it actually is a little more like a one-on-one -on -one in 2024 is, I think, a very interesting question. And I, I think there's sort of, that may happen more naturally this time than it did in 2015, 16, where Trump was an outsider challenger. There was the same sense of just the way the when you're taking on Hillary Clinton in 2015, 16 for the Democrats, the field did narrow to one alternative. This was pretty clear you couldn't split the non-Clinton vote. So I think that could happen. And so I think Trump will have a real race. I mean, I'd still think he's the favorite, but, uh, but a lot can change. Also, the one thing I'd say, I also mentioned is I do think November 2022 matters. I mean, we're going to have an election to which a lot of people are going to focus on. You know, if DeSantis wins by seven points in Florida, that will help donors and others say, look, he really is a better bet than Trump. I mean, Trump won by three. If DeSantis ends up in a closer race than people expect, which I think is possible in Florida, and it's two or three, I think, if you, you know, you think, well, really, is DeSantis any better than Trump? I mean, as a candidate, and a lot of the appeal here isn't a substantive appeal against Trump. It's a, it's an electability appeal. So I think a fair amount depends on some of what happens. And if, if Trumpism looks like it's politically problematic in 2020, that the most radical Trump endorsed candidates go down in states where it looked like they might win. I think that does help the non-Trump candidates in 2024. So, and, and I agree with your analysis here, uh, and I'm guessing that, that Donald Trump is saying the same things, which is one of the right. reasons why he might get in early to prevent that, uh, you know, that, that kind of a, a crowded field. It also might be one of the reasons why he might hesitate, because as we both know, the one great fear that Donald Trump has that overwhelms everything else is a fear of actually losing if he thinks he might lose. So what do you think he's going to do? What, do, what is what, what, what are you looking at? What timeline are you looking at? I think he's very likely to run, and I think he's likely to announce, you know, soon and Labor Day ish. I think it, I think it makes sense from his point of view. Uh, you know, it does probably freeze the others a little bit. It makes people more hesitant. If that means if you're getting in, you're getting it against him. DeSantis doesn't get to say on November fifteenth what he could say if Trump was still making up his mind, which is, well, we don't know who the field's going to be, but I think I've been just real, I've just been reelected in Florida. I think I have something to say to the nation and I'm, run, I'm running or I'm planning, I'm running or mm -hmm. thinking of running and Young does the same, and Christie and everyone else. If Trump's already announced, it's a little harder. Then you're saying I'm, I'm running to. against Trump. So I think right. it's in Trump's personal interest, may not be in the Republican party's interest, to uh, announce early. And look, most of what's going to happen in November is going to happen anyway, based on other kinds of trends and, and factors. And Trump probably figures you might as well take credit for the good stuff that happens. He get blamed for the bad stuff anyway, you know, by people who want to blame him. So I, I think Trump's personal self-interest, which is kind of the key to his actions, 
uh, will lead him to announce uh, in September, which incidentally is another big wild card for what happens in o- this November, though, because Trump will be mm-hmm. more on the ballot than Biden in some ironic way, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, or could be at least, and that will affect things. So an awful lot, go- this is a very unusual off-year election in that respect. Sure is. Is, that's why I don't quite buy the conventional, well, we always know that in the first off-year, this happens, this tends to happen, history suggests. We've never had a situation like this with Trump lurking and maybe announcing with the Republicans nominating the kind of candidates they're nominating, with Liz Cheney probably going down to a de- defeat in August, which I think will, if she does lose, which will sort of cement in a lot of swing voters' minds the notion of how radical the party's gone. It's one thing to nominate Mastroianni, whatever his name is, in Pennsylvania, or this guy, Cox, in Maryland, or we'll see what happens in Arizona, and maybe Greitens, that will all add up. But then sort of also repudiating Cheney, it just puts kind of the, the, the dots that I, so to speak, crosses that T about what kind of Republican party we're facing. And I, so I think the combination of all this, yeah, puts Trump on the ballot and Trumpism on the ballot in this off-year election as much as it puts the incumbent Democratic administration or even the incumbent democratically controlled Congress on the ballot. And you also have another factor, which is the crazy factor, which you talked about uh, with Joe Trippi uh, la- last week. And, and and we're also seeing something kind of interesting happening in the Senate races. Uh, Axios reporting this morning, Democrats across the 10 most competitive Senate races are outraising Republicans by more than $75 million among small dollar donors those giving less than $200. So this is kind of interesting that you're seeing this kind of surge. And of course, the Republicans have lots of problematic candidates in swing states, Herschel Walker, Eric Greitens, Blake Masters in Arizona, Eric Greitens in Missouri. Uh, And, you know, Axios looks at this and goes, the big picture here is that Trump-induced donor fatigue and other factors are impacting the GOP grassroots, prompting Republican candidates to rely more heavily on high-dollar donors. But this would also be a suggestion, just one of those indicators that that even though you know the conventional wisdom is that Republicans are far more motivated this year than Democrats, uh, that's not true among small-dollar donors. So does this actually matter? Who are pretty good, have been in the past, a decent leading indicator sometimes of of turnout and stuff. No, I, I I think Democrats may by now, partly because of also Roe v. Wade and stuff, be as motivated as as Republicans and the extremism in general. You know, someone else pointed out, I can't remember what article it was this morning, that incidentally, the, who's getting a lot of these small dollar donations on the right? Donald Trump and his various entities. Right. He's soaking hoovering up, up the money. Right? He is. You know? He's not spending it for any of these right. candidates. So if you're a Democrat, I think you should, you know, it's like encourage them, give a lot of money to Trump. Just don't give money to actual candidates who were on the ballot in 2022. Well, I think it's interesting, the Axios analysis, a concerted Republican effort to build a small dollar fundraising apparatus independent of Trump's brand appears to be faltering while Democrats are building on the massive grassroots financial success they saw in 2020. Okay, so speaking of uh, Democrats, on this podcast, uh, we have frequently beat up on Democrats for being bad at politics, for stumbling and bumbling, or perhaps being tone deaf. But our colleague Tim Miller makes a really good case, I think, in, in my Morning Shots newsletter, that the House vote yesterday to codify uh, you know, same-sex marriage and and interracial marriage was was smart politicking. He said, uh, you know, I mean, for, for some reason, the Democrats have spent much of the last 19 months, you know, fighting among themselves. But that wasn't the case yesterday when the House voted to codify the right to marry for gay couples. Every Democrat voted in favor. Only 47 Republicans supported the bill, 157 apparently believing that that his marriage uh, should be, you know, could possibly be, be revoked by the state so much for freedom. And the case he's making, that Tim is making, is the politics and the policy align perfectly for Democrats. If Chuck Schumer brings the bill up, it may very well attract 10 Republican votes, giving President Biden a big worthwhile win. If it falls short, the Democrats will have another campaign issue to use targeting uh, suburban swing voters and apathetic young voters. And the House votes already providing some political opportunity for Senate Democrats. I mean, among the, the no votes on gay marriage, was uh, Congressman Ted Budd, the Republican nominee for Senate in North Carolina. So he's now on record with a vote that's going to allow the state of North Carolina to annul gay marriages. And that is not a winner, he writes, in Charlotte. Let me tell you, you know, well, it won't be the number one voting issue in North Carolina, but it could be part of a broader campaign to demonstrate how radical the GOP is. And he says, 
look, uh, this is an interesting template. I mean, imagine if Democrats expanded the expanded the same notion across a host of issues, you know, codifying Lawrence, uh, which said you can't criminalize private sexual acts, uh, guaranteed access to contraception, a right to abortion in the case of rape and incest, a ban on semi-automatic firearms for people under 21, prescription drug prices. How, how about the Mike Pence Memorial Act of 2022 mm-hmm. clarifying the vice president has no role in overturning an election? Now, would they get 60 votes in the Senate? Maybe. Would Republicans look insane, more insane, if they blocked all of them? Yes, they would. So your thoughts on this, Bill? I mean, it's always almost always good to split the other party if you can right. keep your party together. And I think that's that happened in the House. It's been amazing how f- few times it's uh, happened in the last year and a half. There were other opportunities to do it. But the Democrats uh, talked themselves into packaging everything to these massive bills, which then allowed the Republicans to pick the worst part of the bill, the one thing they did, and to say, well, we can't be for that. But I think Speaker Pelosi has intelligently, finally, maybe, but it's like she's always been smarter about this, honestly, than the Senate Democrats, Senate Democratic leadership, you know, picked individual items. And let's have a high profile vote on Wednesday on this. And let's do contraception on or Tuesday on, on, on marriage. Let's do contraception on Thursday. Let's not just have one giant bill, which you can pick the weakest part of and oppose. So I do think this is an important moment. I'm very struck by what Tim says about North Carolina. Tom Tillis, the incumbent Republican senator, who's not up for re-election this year in North Carolina, said he was inclined to vote for uh, the mm. protection for same-sex and interracial marriage, for that matter, uh, in uh, what it com- if it comes to the floor of the Senate. Uh, that will be interesting because Bud had voted against it in the House. And so, you know, the Democratic candidate in North Carolina can say, hey, look, even this Republican, even the incumbent Republican senator from North Carolina voted for it in Utah. All the Republican members of Congress voted for it. Seems mm. to me that Evan, Evan McMullen, who's running an ind- interesting independent race against okay. uh, Mike Lee and the Democrats stepped down. So he has kind of a real, some chance to get pretty close at least. Well, he is pretty close. I think he has some chance to win. Uh, I don't know, honestly, if the citizenry of Utah is on board with these days with same-sex marriage, but all the Republican members voted for it. Mike Lee will presumably be against it. So Evan McMullen can say, look, I, I'm here with these Republican members of Congress you just elected and thinking this is a good idea to codify what has in fact been the law of the land for seven years. And Mike Lee's the one who's the extremist and being against it. So I do think it opens up political opportunities. They should do it on a whole bunch of other issues. And maybe they will. I, of course, was then very distressed to see Dick Durbin, the number two Democrat in the Senate, who's a pretty shrewd political guy usually, I think, saying, oh, well, I'm not sure we can get to that. We've got to go on recess. You know, we've got a big, a lot of things to accomplish. I mean, really, I mean, how uh, Schumer and Durbin, I've got to say, who are intelligent people, and I know them both, and I actually you know, respect them as individuals, have just not been very effective politically. It's tough in a 50-50 Senate. I agree with that. But I, I'm just struck by their, uh, I don't know, they just don't seem to be thinking about this in, in, in a politically no. intelligent way. And it's, it's not like we're, anyone's asking them to abandon their principles. They believe in this. So, I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not like this is something contrary that they're supposed to do. This is the right thing to do from their point of view, certainly. And they're still sort of hesitant about doing it. I, I can't really understand that. And then saying publicly, well, the reason is we have to have a four, five, literally five week, I think is what's currently scheduled, yeah. uh, break in August. Really? really? I think most Americans look at that and think, you know what, maybe you could take a three or four week break or one week or two week break like the rest of us do, you know? Yeah. When you say out loud that you're basically your top priority is the oh so critical August recess, that's just right. like, what? I mean, right. look around you. I mean, there are things that are actually going on. No, I mean, to reiterate what you just said, though, there there was this early addiction on, on the part of uh, the Democratic leaders to these omnibus bills that were just packed with all kinds of, of things that, um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, nobody really knew what was when what was in them. They were packed so tight with some good ideas and some horrendous ideas that they were dead on arrival, um, as opposed to you know, these very, very clear votes, you know, have a, you, you could, you know, have, have a big vote on, you know, reproductive rights, or you could say, let's have an up or down vote on the right to abortion in the case of rape or incest, make people go on the, the record, split your opposition, guaranteed access to contraception. That's why this was so smart. There was actually an interesting take in the, in the, in the Washington Post as well about this. So you and I are both old enough to remember when a decade ago, when the Democratic vice president, who was then Joe Biden, got ridiculed for an alleged gaffe for saying he supported gay marriage and Republicans had used gay marriage as a wedge issue against Democrats. Well, what happened yesterday was, you know, a reversal, you know, a switch in the polarities, because yesterday Democrats used gay marriage 
to divide the Republicans, splintering them on the issue. So we have gone from a decade ago where Republicans thought this is a great issue for us. We will embarrass and uh, split Democrats to now Democrats are completely united on it. And it is Republicans who are splintering and Republicans would have to take the the embarrassing votes. Also, I think the legitimacy of this vote is underlined not just by Justice Thomas's concurring opinion where he says, you know, if we don't recognize a right to privacy in the Constitution for abortion, then we ought to use the same logic to overturn all of these other things. And then you have Ted Cruz who comes out and says, yeah, Bergefell was a it was an overreach by the court. And so they are saying it explicitly that this would be their agenda, that they would overturn this. And again, it would be gross political malpractice for Democrats not to take them at their word and not to show a certain amount of urgency about this, right? So, yeah, urgency is the, is what's been lacking in certain ways. And and again, you the ones who are most urgent sometimes are the furthest left, which they're entitled to be, but their pop, their policies aren't wise usually or popular often. Whereas here, you get some urgency for what's a pretty much a consensus position in the nation now, and obviously one that the court uh, imposed, you might say, or ratified seven years ago. It already had become the case in many states, of course, and now is on the ballot. I don't know. You're in Wisconsin. That's a fairly socially conservative state, but I don't know. It's a, is it mm. obvious that Ron Johnson is on the right side of that? If he, well, I guess he'll vote against uh, same-sex marriage, but I don't know. There are a lot of uh, swing voters in Milwaukee suburbs who probably think that's, you know, like it's been the law for seven years, whatever you thought about that decision as a matter of jurisprudence. We now have it everywhere in the country. The country's not falling apart. Families are not being damaged by the fact that that uh, the, some of those families now are, are, are same-sex marriages. Uh, and I don't know, it feels to me like it, it's not an easy vote for these Republican senators. Well, exactly. And let's go back to the idea of cumulative effect. So you can, you know, some of the smart kids are pointing out that, you know, abortion is not the number one issue. Abortion is not necessarily going to move as many votes as Democrats would hope. And they're probably right about that. But it's the cumulative effect of all of these culture war issues that I think will have an effect or could have an effect, you know, in places like Madison and the suburbs of Milwaukee, where it's not just an up or down vote on abortion. Because, I mean, really, quite frankly, here in Wisconsin, it becomes a binary choice. You, you know, Republicans will uh, make, make sure that abortion is, is is banned. There's already a law on, on, the, on the book. Democrats, I think, will push back. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll push back against that. But same thing with, uh, with gay marriage. So the cumulative effect you have the right to contraception, the right to abortion, um, whether or not you are going to, you know, the possibility of annulling gay marriages. All of these things stacked up together, I think will make a difference and do make it more problematic for somebody like Ron Johnson, who is problematic to begin with. But again, and I'm sorry to be kind of a, a broken record on this, a lot depends on uh, who the Democrats choose to run against him. These are choices, they're not up or down referendums. No, and precisely because the Democrats correctly, I think, have moved over to understanding that they have much better chance making these choices in individual states rather than a referendum on the Biden administration, since Biden's at, you know, God knows, 35% approval in Wisconsin, whereas these, you know, the actual races for governor and senator are more like 50, you know, or fifth close to 50-50 right now, it looks like, and Johnson's not very popular. It becomes more important who you nominate, right? You can't prosecute the extremism argument very well if you yourself have a lot of stuff on record that a lot of voters look at and think well, that's kind of extreme on the other side. So maybe I'll just, you know, stick with the Mitch McConnell Republicans and in, in my vote here for the Senate. So I think it's not it's been very helpful to the Democrats to nominate mostly, mostly moderate or yeah. I mean, Fetterman's more complicated figure, but even he's not a sort of caricature of a lefty dem you know well I, uh, yes it's statewide and but that it, is the danger here yeah yeah but i think it's really it seems to be the danger in, in wisconsin where uh mandela barnes just has a lot of stuff on record which i think he sincerely believed or believes and is a decent person and all that but it just it's not quite where wisconsin voters are no and 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 ron johnson is not backing off from uh some of the crazy stuff although i will say that the airwaves it's all inflation it's all crime it's all the border all the time uh, here in Wisconsin. Bill Crystal, once again, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. We will talk again soon. My pleasure, Charlie. The Bulwark Podcast is produced by Katie Cooper with audio production by Jonathan Siri. I'm Charlie Sykes. Thank you for listening to today's Bulwark Podcast, and we'll be back tomorrow. We'll do this all over again. You 
loved Lala Kent on Vanderpump Rules. Now get to know her on Give Them Lala. With her assistant, Jess. Last night, Lisa wanted to clean out the fridge. And I was like, I can't lift anything. I'm not helping. Number one, Lala was told she can't lift anything, you guys. So it's not like she's just like, I'm not lifting anything. She no, but I'm told. not helping. But even my, even my friends know. I'll write you a check. I'll okay. do some Venmo. <laughs> I'll have something wired. <laughs> I am not helping. I don't and like it. Give them Lala. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.